know the Bible was sent from God, the old as well as the new, is part and holy the living word. I know the Bible is true. I know, I know. Meet the raging storms of time. Its pages burn with the truth eternal, and they glow with the light sublime. The Bible stands, so the hills may tumble. It will stand when the earth shall crumble and it plants. My feet on its firm foundation for the Bible stands. The Bible stands like a mountain towering far above the walks of men. Its truth by none ever was refuted and destroyed. It's the never can. The Bible stands though the hills may tumble, it will firmly stand when the earth shall crumble. I will plant my feet on its firm foundation for the Bible. And it will forever when the world has passed away. By inspiration it has been given all its precepts I will obey. The Bible stands though the hills may tumble it we when the earth shall crumble, I will plant my feet on its firm foundation for the Bible stand. I know the story of Christ is true. His virgin glorious birth, his life, his death, and the open tomb, and his return to the earth. I know, I know, I know, I know, I know the Bible is true. I know, I know, I know, I know, I know the Bible is true. The Bible is bad, the whole way through. I know the Bible is true. The Bible is bad, the whole way through. I know. Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you for the beginning of this Congress this year.
We thank you for Johnny mercies you have given to everyone. We bless your name because you have a good purpose for us here. And we're praying, O oh Lord, that everyone in this Congress will be mightily blessed in Jesus' name. Because it's as you bless the leadership, the membership of your church will be blessed as well. It's as you bless your church and strengthen your church that the world will be evangelized. And we're praying, O oh Lord, you shower your blessings upon us, not just because of who we are, not just because of our desire, but because of the influence and the impact it will have on your church and on the world at large. Bless your people in Jesus' name. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. I welcome every one of you to the Congress of this year. This year we have decentralized our Congress. At this time now, we are having this one at the headquarters church. And it has all the states of Nigeria and all the countries in West Africa with Chad, with Cameroon, with Equatorial Guinea added to them. And those of you in Gabon, you know the, your own date, and uh, we're making this special interpretation into French for you. So that as you listen to the cases, you hear directly in your language over there too. And we're going to have another center in Zambia uh, for the southern parts of Africa. And those of you there, you are hearing the message and you are hearing the interpretation in your language as well. And I want to appeal to you, those of you who are there in Gabon, or you are in Zambia, or any other location where you are having the Congress, I want to remind you that the Congress is a meeting of leaders in the church. In our leadership meetings, we want to give quality time to the Lord to speak to our hearts. If he wants to get us through until midnight for the evening messages, here we are. If the leaders are strong, the church will be strong. If the church is strong, the world will be evangelized. This is not a retreat. It's a congress for leaders. Those of you who are here, I want to encourage you that you will pay attention. You'll be very, very patient. We have decided in deeper life meetings that we do not time God anymore. And we do not tell God, after God has spent one hour, one hour, 30 minutes, we never tell God to shut up. We tell God, go ahead, evermore, give us this bread. So those of you who are here, you make sure that you do not do anything that will hinder the flow of the Spirit of God, the preaching of the Word of God. And those of you in Gabon, those of you in Zambia, anywhere you are, you're coming to the hall, it means you are ready. For whatever the Lord wants to say, however long it will take him, here we are in the presence of God. And tonight, I don't know when you are going to, you know, go back. We didn't come here to eat. We didn't come here to sleep. We came here to listen to the word of God. And it's going to take time. Our prayer is that God will use this Congress, this gathering, to move every one of you forward in the work of God and in the will of God. Through this gathering, we want God to be glorified. We want our ministries to be expanded. We want our lives to be strengthened. We want the fulfillment and the realization of the perfect will of God in our lives as well as in our ministries. As we look at the program in your hand, we're starting tonight with the Word of God. And at the end on Saturday morning, we're ending with the will of the Lord. And that's the way it ought to be. You start with the Word. The word works effectually in your heart, and then you move out to go and do the will of God. We're told in 1 Peter chapter 1, reading from verse 24, For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as a flower of grass. The grass withers, and the flower thereof falleth away. And then it says in verse 25, but the watch of the Lord endureth forever. And here is the good news. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. It tells us that man lives here just for a short time. He will die eventually. It says all flesh is as grass. Is there today? Is not there tomorrow? And it tells us all the glory of man. The inventions of man. The achievements of man and all the possessions of man 
All the property of man. Everything that human beings are running after. All the glory of man. All the things that the people of the world are desiring. He tells us is as a flower that fades away. But then he tells us there is something that endures forever. There is something that lasts and lasts and lasts. And even when the whole world has been burnt in fire and everything is gone away, there is something that endures, abides forever. He tells us everything you see now, everything your heart is running after, everything that you desire, everything you want to possess, everything you think you even have, everything one day is going to be forgotten, is going to be burnt away. Even the flesh, even the man himself is going to die and is going to be buried. What man is, what man has, what man runs after, what man possesses, everything is going to perish. And then he tells us, if there is anything you ought to seek, if there is anything you ought to desire, if there is anything that ought to be on the top of the list of what you are running after, it is this watch of God which is eternal, which is infinite and which abides forever. And this is the reason we gather together here. Uh, you wonder how wise or how foolish men and women of this generation are. The ephemeral things, the passing things, the useless things, the worthless things, the things that will not last forever. They are the things that human beings are running after. And they allow those temporary things to take the eternal away from them. But the things that abide forever, the watch of God, the life in Christ, the Christian experiences, the things that will see you from earth and take you to heaven. They are the things that the hearts of the natural man, of the average Christian, is even repelled of, is not even seeking after. And yet, the word of God, which abides forever, is what should be your very heart, your very desire. And the things that turns you on, and the things that occupy your heart, and the things you are saying, Oh Lord, take the world away, take every other thing away. This word of the Lord, that abides forever, give it to me. And so Peter tells us by inspiration, he says, This watch of the Lord abides and deals forever. And then, let's those people hearing Peter, reading the epistle of Peter, will think the sin is far away in the sky, or the sin is far away down deep in the valley, or the sin is somewhere unreachable, unattainable somewhere. He says, No, it's very near you. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. And so during this Congress, all we want you to center your affection on, all we want you to focus on, all we want you to concentrate on is this watch of the Lord. And whoever comes to preach, whoever comes to read the word, whoever comes to apply the word to our lives, you will open your two ears and you will open your heart as well because this is why you came, so that the word of God can enter into you and have an effect in your life, a change a change that it becomes and then it transforms your life. It transforms your ministry. You are not the same man anymore. You are not the same minister anymore because the word of God effectually works in your heart. Why is this word of God so important? Number one, because we got it by revelation. That brings us to point number one in our message. The revelation of the word of the Lord. The revelation of the word of the Lord. In Second Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and verse 17. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Here the word of God tells us something. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. When it says all scripture, that means the whole Bible. That means every part of the Old Testament, every part of the New Testament, everything in totality is given by inspiration of God. We got everything by inspiration from God. It's breathed out from God. It's coming from the very heart of God. It's coming from the very mind of God. It's coming from the depth of the intelligence, of the knowledge, of the spirit, of the living God. And it is not just a part of the scriptures. That were given by inspiration is the entirety, is the totality, is the completeness, is everything, is every jot, every tittle, 
Every sentence and every verse, every chapter, everything you see in the Bible, from the uh, first uh, page to the very last page, from the first word to the very last word, everything is given by inspiration of God. The part you understand, the part you don't understand, the part you agree with, the part you don't agree with, the part you have read, the part you have not read, everything is given by inspiration of God. The part religious people reject, and the part other people reject, and the part maybe you reject, everything, the totality, the entirety of the scriptures is given by inspiration of God. The one you don't like to read, the one you don't like to hear, everything is given by inspiration of God. And then he tells us the usefulness, the words, the profit of this word of God is profitable for doctrine. A preacher, a minister establishing any doctrine must go back to the Bible and get from the mouth of God what he teaches and what he preaches because this whole Bible is profitable for doctrine. And it is profitable for reproof and also for correction. You as a minister, as you begin to teach the doctrines of the Bible, you give it to your people and then you begin to examine their lives. You begin to evaluate their Christian lives. And if there are areas they are deviating from that word of God, from the doctrines of the Bible, which you have given unto them, it is this same Bible that is profitable for the doctrine you taught, that is profitable also for reproof and correction. It already tells us then, the ministry of the word, we will teach doctrine through the Bible, and then we reprove people through the Bible, and we correct their lives through the Bible. That's why the Bible is given. It's profitable for doctrine, and for reproof, and for correction. And it says, for instruction in righteousness. Which is then, the reason why we are teaching the Bible, and the reason why we are instructing people is to lead them from sin to salvation, from darkness unto light, from unrighteousness unto righteousness, from self unto sanctification. The reason why we are teaching the word of God is so that we can lead the people of God into righteousness. And the ultimate goal is that the child of God, the woman of God, the man of God may be perfect. How many times have we listened to the word of God? How many times do we go for a Bible study? How many times do we go for a retreat where the word of God is taught? How many times do we go for a Sunday worship where the word of God is taught? And the majority of us in our mind, we never think, I'm going to church, I'm listening to the word of God, I'm going to get to the congress, that I may be perfect. I'm searching the scriptures that I may be perfect. I'm listening to that cassette that I may be perfect. I'm here at the Congress so that all the impurities in my life, all the imperfections in my life, all the unrighteousness in my life, all the weaknesses in my life, all the humanness in my life, all the things that will not measure up to the life of Christ in my life, I'm in this Congress so that I can be made perfect. That the man of God may be perfect. If the word of God comes to you, and after hearing the word of God, that word of God leaves you the way you were before. The ministry of the word of God has not been allowed to work effectually in your life. If you come in with carnality, and after hearing the word of God, the carnality is still there. If you come in with imperfection, after hearing the word of God, the imperfection is still there. You come in with impatience, and after hearing the word of God, the impatience is still there. You come in with prayerlessness, after hearing the word of God, the prayerlessness is still there. You come in with self and self-will, and after hearing the word of God, the self and the self-will is still there. You come in with hatred, and after hearing the word of God, the hatred is still there. The ministry of the word of God is to lead that child of God out of where that child of God is and lead that child of God higher. Lead you to perfection. Then it says, thoroughly prepared, thoroughly equipped, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. 
The word of God comes into our life to strengthen us and prepare us for higher service, for greater service. That's what we were not able to do before when the word of God comes in and it burns like fire. When the word of God comes in and it cleanses like water. When the word of God comes in and it feeds you like food. When the word of God comes in and it knocks you like hammer. When the word of God comes in and then it, it, it breaks you down, it melts you, it removes you, it fills you it energizes you it gives you a new vision it gives you a new courage it gives you a new conviction then you are prepared to move ahead and do what you are not able to do before and is prepared furnished unto all good works because this word came from god as god is perfect his word is perfect so there is no professor there is no university fellow that was born yesterday and they learned abc and can put some things together and begin to say i find this one to correct i find this one to adjust in the word of god who is man that you will correct the perfect god because god is infallible the word of god is infallible because god is pure the word of god is pure because God is eternal, the word of God is infinite. Infinite in depth, infinite in height, infinite in its influence, its impact upon the lives of man. Because God is holy, the doctrines of the Bible are holy. And the word is unerring, it's infallible. You cannot find anything to correct in it. Because God is supreme, this word, this book is superior to any other book you can find on earth. It's powerful in its influencing power. And it changes lives, it transforms life. In fact, what it does in the life of man is nothing short of a miraculous transformation. And you will see that this word is of God because of the unity there. You have many, many authors there over many, many years. In fact, actually hundreds of years. And yet, even though some of the writers, pen men, did not see themselves, did not know themselves, yet you find a wonderful supernatural unity in the word. It's because God is the author of the whole Bible. Let's think about it. There is no other book on earth whatever title it may have, that has as much influence on man, on history, on the world, on generation after generation, as the Bible has. When you think of the prophecies of the Bible that had been fulfilled already, all over these years, you know that this Bible has a divine origin. This is the book that reveals the might of God, that shows you the state of man, that shows you the only way of salvation, and it tells you the doom of sinners who refuse to repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's a book that tells you about the eternal joy and happiness and bliss of the people that believe on the Lord and live their lives according to the precepts of this Bible. In Second Peter chapter 1 verse 21, it, it tells us, For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but Holy men of God spake as well as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. He is still telling you that this is the revelation of the Lord himself. That all those prophecies as you come, as you start from Genesis, all through to Malachi, it says, all those prophecies did not come by the will of man, by the intelligence of man, by the opinions and ideas of men, but holy men of God spoke, as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Verse already tells us the authenticity of the Old Testament. And when Jesus came into this world, the very uh, word personified, he didn't correct the Old Testament. He knew the word of the Old Testament to be the word of the living God and the mighty God. But already under the old covenant, Almighty God himself made us to understand that the Old Testament will not be the end of his revelation to man. In Deuteronomy chapter 18 verse 18, chapter 18 verse 18, I will raise them up a prophet, capital P, from among their brethren, like unto thee Moses, and will put my words in his mouth. And he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. He's talking about when Jesus will come. 
And the father said, As I put my words in the mouths of the Old Testament prophets, and from Genesis to Malachi, everything is the inspired word of God. Christ will come. I will put my words in his mouth so that what you read coming out of Christ will be the revelation of the word of the Lord as well. Verse 19 it says, And it shall come to pass that whosoever will not hearken unto my words, which he shall speak in my name, I will require it of him. That already makes you to look forward to the New Testament. It already gives you the conviction that even the New Testament, coming from the mouth of Jesus Christ, was inspired by the Lord himself. John chapter 17 verse 8. John 17 verse 8. I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me. All those words that Jesus spoke, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, in the Gospels, they are the words of the Father, coming from the revelation of the Father, giving unto the Lord Jesus Christ, and Jesus said, I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me. And they have received them, and have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. That now already tells us that the Gospels, that we got that by inspiration as well. John chapter 14 verse 26. John 14 26. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things, and shall bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. How did Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, how did they remember the words that Jesus spoke? How did they eventually write down the gospel according to Matthew, according to Mark, according to Luke, and according to John? Jesus said, I'll send the Holy Spirit to you. And when that Holy Spirit comes, he will remind you every sentence, every word, every jot, and every teacher, so that you'll be able to faithfully record down everything I have said unto you. How about the rest of the New Testament apart from the Gospels? Jesus said that Holy Spirit, when he comes, he shall teach you all things. It's as a result of that, we have the epistles. It's as a result of that, we have everything all through to Revelation. John chapter 16 verse 13. How be it when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that he shall speak, and he will show you things to come. You can see then that uh, the Old Testament, the New Testament, they have come to us as revelation of the word of the Lord. Maybe as a person reading the Bible, you say, yes, but Jesus was speaking to those people who were his immediate disciples. But some of the books of the New Testament are written by Paul. Do we have any information? Do we have any authority to say that all those words of Paul the Apostle, that they are also inspired of God, a revelation coming from the Lord? In Ephesians chapter 3 verse 3, Ephesians chapter 3 verse 3, how that by revelation he made known, he has made known unto me the mystery as I wrote afore before in a few words. Whereby, when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of God, which in other ages, what you have in the Old Testament, was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. So it is very clear that the same inspiration of the Spirit of God that you have on all the writings in the Old Testament, the same inspiration is claimed for the Gospels, and the same inspiration is claimed for the Epistles, both of the immediate disciples and apostles of Jesus, and the apostles that came after, like Paul the Apostle. The same inspiration is claimed for them. From Genesis then to Revelation, you have the revelation of the Lord given by the inspiration of God. That's why it tells us in Proverbs chapter 30. Proverbs 30 verse 5. 
Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. Art thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. As we see that the totality, the entirety of the scripture has been given by inspiration of God, he then tells us, not only even tells us, he warns us of the great danger of adding to that word, and the great danger, and the great damnation, and the great judgment, indignation of God, eternal wrath of God, that will come upon the people that subtract anything from the word of God. In Revelation chapter 22 verse 18, for I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man, any man, no matter who you are, any man, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man, any man anywhere, here or there, if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things that are written in this book. What you have in your hand then is the revelation of the word of the Lord. What you'll be reading and studying this week is the revelation of the word of the Lord. What we're calling upon you to believe and to put your heart in and to put your faith in is the revelation of the word of the Lord. The challenge we are bringing to you during this congress is that you will read this word, you will believe this word, you will preach this word, you will practice this word, you will obey this word because it is the revelation of the word of the Lord. But as we look at the word of the Lord, there are two different attitudes people have. Some reject, others receive. That leads me to point number two. The rejection of the word of the Lord. The rejection of the word of the Lord. As the word of God comes out, there are people that reject. And we talk, and when we talk about rejection, rejection comes in various ways. For the children of Israel, there were some of them that reject totally the word of God without accepting any part of it. There were some of them that accepted some and rejected just a part. You see, of the uh, children of Israel, some of them just told the prophet point blank what you have said. According to the word of the Lord, we reject, we refuse, we are not going to obey. Total rejection. Other people like Saul, they had selective obedience, selective rejection. They accepted and they practiced the ones that were convenient for them and the ones that were popular and they rejected the ones that were not very popular suitable for the flesh others like the pharisees they accepted the external implication or interpretation of what they read but the spiritual internal inward impact and demand of the word that they rejected. Remember, the word of God makes us to understand the great loss, the judgment, the indignation of God, the eternal suffering of the people that reject any part of the word of God. In Jeremiah chapter 44, reading from verse 15, Jeremiah 44 verse 15. Open your Bible if you are not able to read the Bible. It disqualifies you already in the sight of God as a minister of the gospel. Because you have no right to take the Bible, read to other people. When you yourself, if you are not willing to read the Bible, you are disqualified as ministers. The word of God comes to you and challenges you to obey. And you refuse to obey. That cancels your right. To invite other people to obey the word of God. If you don't obey the word of God, you have no right to call other people to obey the word of God. It cancels your ministry in the sight of God. If your heart does not retain the word of God, you do not have any right 
to command other people that their hearts should retain the word of God that you are preaching. Your own rejection, your own refusal, cancels the call of God upon your life to be a minister of the world. If God cannot get your attention to hear the word of God, to read the word of God, to meditate on the word of God, to exalt the word of God above anything, everything in your life. If God cannot get your attention and teach you what he wants, it means you too, you are not qualified to be an instrument in the hands of God to call other people to listen to the word of God. Your rejection of the call of God upon your life to listen to the word of God cancels your ministry. I don't care what they call you, overseer, bishop, coordinator, anything. If you reject the word of God, the Lord has rejected you from being a minister. You see, how these people in Jeremiah chapter 44, how they reveal the state of their hearts, See how these people just told Jeremiah point blank. They didn't even hide it that this was their attitude of rejection of the word of God. Please, turn the cassette over. Verse 15, then all the men which knew that their wives had burnt incense unto other gods and all the women that stood by a great multitude, even of all the people that dwelt in the land of Egypt in Pathros. And then answered Jeremiah saying, verse 16, as for the word thou hast spoken, unto us in the name of the lord we will not hearken unto thee but we will certainly do whatsoever sin goes out of our own mouths do you see that rejecting the word is not a new thing and if you do, if you reject the word, you'll not be the first person, you'll not be the last person. But the consequence of rejecting the word of God is that once you reject the word of the Lord, there is nothing for you to preach also. You have no right to talk about the almighty God when you are not under the authority and the control and the direction of that almighty God. It cancels your ministry. I see many people running about saying they are preaching. I see some people even leaving this ministry and establishing a new ministry and they are preaching. I see banners and posters outside. Preachers, preachers, preachers. They themselves are rejecting the word of God. They are not living by the word of God. They are not living their lives. They are not raising their families. They are not controlling their lives by the authority and the teaching and the doctrine of the Bible. No matter what they call themselves, their rejection of the word of God has cancelled any ministry they profess or pretend to have. I see some people who are still here. They have not run out yet. They have not established a different ministry yet. But the word of God has no control over them. The word of God has no authority over them. They do not tremble at hearing the word of God. And there is no commitment. And there is no absolute surrender. And there is no yieldedness. And there is no submission to thus says the Lord. Go to their homes. See their children. See their wives. See their families. See the things they have at home. See the language of their mouth. See the actions of their lives and see how they behave, and see how they live, they have rejected the word of God. Let them call you any name, overseer, whatever. If you reject the word of God on the authority of this infallible, unchanging word, you have lost your ministry. All you have, you may sit like Saul on the throne. The Lord has told Samuel, he has rejected you. For Samuel chapter 15, verse 22. Chapter 15, verse 22. And Samuel said, As the Lord has great delight in bond offerings and sacrifices, as in obeying the watch of the Lord, behold, 
To obey is better than sacrifice and to work in than the fat of rams. Hey, those of you in Gabon, look up here. You are in Zambia. You are listening to this in case Look up here. And hey, just as if I were there present with you, look up and listen. I am still to find somebody in our church, in our ministry here. If I gave a message and I said, my brother, go and preach this message. And the brother will reply, I'm sorry, pastor, I cannot preach now. There is a problem between me and my wife. I need to settle that for because to obey is better than sacrifice. I'm still to find somebody that we're going to call, come and officiate. And the fellow will say, I'm sorry, I cannot officiate. My son has a booty girl in the family way. My daughter has become pregnant. I am disqualified. Pastor, you didn't know. That's why you are telling me both. I remember the word of God. To obey is better than sacrifice and to hack in than a fat of rams. I'm still to find somebody will give assignment to or seminar to and the fellow will say, I'm sorry, I cannot do that now. In my place of work, they accuse me of fraud and the policemen are after me and it will not glorify God if I stand on the pulpit. I'm talking about righteousness and holiness and I'm telling other people to come to the Lord and live a straightforward life when the badge of fraud is upon my neck, upon Upon my forehead, in my place of work, excuse me, let me go and set you before I come back to offer any sacrifice. Many people don't understand, they do not understand that obedience is better than sacrifice. In verse 23, for rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft. When Saul came to the throne, he sat for all the witches in the land, and he drove them away and destroyed them. And Samuel said, Saul, in the sight of God, you are like a witch or a wizard, because rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft. How many of these ministers, deliverance ministers, running after witches, running after wizards, chasing wizards away, and chasing witches away, and praying and fasting, and if they point out anybody, you are a witch, you are a wizard, they will do anything to drive them away, while rebellion is inside their heart, disobedience is inside their heart, and they will not totally obey the Lord. What did Saul do? Saul did not slap Samuel. Saul did not disregard Samuel in a direct way. All that Saul did is that part of the word that Samuel had told him of the word of the Lord. Saul did not carry it out. It was that partial disobedience that Samuel referred to you by the Spirit of God. You are rebellious and your rebellion classifies you as a witch, as a wizard in the sight of the Lord. How many of the people here, prayer warriors, prayer warriors, prayer warriors, running after witches, that one has evil spirit. How many of the women here, I dreamt about that woman, she has familiar spirit, I cannot do anything with her. But your rebellion is as bad, as evil, as iniquitous, as witchcraft in the sight of the Lord. That's the word of the Lord. Verse 23, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. How many people now even take stubbornness as a good quality? The more you can be stubborn, and the more you can show openly, physically, directly, that you are not one of these weak, humble gentle people that will sit down when they say sit down that will stand up when they say stand up that will be patient when they say be patient you are not one of these weak weak people to show that you are strong is then you show stubbornness and then if in your district or local church they say this one has been coming to church uh, for one year and we saw idol inside our house and then you, you say pastor make announcement these are the people spoiling our church drive them out anybody in this our deep and light church having idol bowing down to something she must not be here drive her out my friend, go and sit down. Your stubbornness classifies you as idol worshiper. And in verse 23, the latter part, because 
thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, the Lord has also rejected thee from being king. And when we reject the word of the Lord, the Lord rejects our service, He rejects our sacrifice, He rejects our ministry. We are nothing in the sight of God. Once disobedience, so the word of God is there. Can salvation be there plus sin? Can sanctification be there plus disobedience and rebellion? Once disobedience or sin, once it is there, salvation is gone, ministry is gone. In Hosea chapter 4 verse 6, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge because thou hast rejected knowledge i also will reject thee and thou shalt be no priest unto me seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy god i will also forget thy children i've been trying to get the Palai bible church to come back to the bible and I've been trying to tell Deeper Life Bible Church in recent weeks and months and years that once the parents reject the word of God, that those parents, those people, ministers, they are not qualified anymore to serve the Lord. You see what it says here? Because you have rejected knowledge, I also have rejected thee. And that rejection means you will no more be priests, officiating ministers, for the Lord wants to reject the word of God. And then it says, seeing that you have forgotten the law of your God, I will also forget your children. I've been trying to tell the, our church at the headquarters here that all these uh, youth choir, young, young people, they may sing like Nightingale and they may play instruments like Beethoven or Handel. If they reject the word of God, if the impact of the word of God, obedience to the word of God is not in their lives, we reject their singing. We reject their playing. The only condition that anybody, young or old, you parents or your children, will step on deeper life platform, pull pitch, and sing, play instrument, and do anything, is that I see that this world, from cover to cover, this world, in every doctrine, this world, in everything it says, that you bow before it, you surrender to it, you yield yourself to it, Otherwise, no matter who you are, you are coming from the campus, you are coming from a secondary school, you are coming from your professional tower, wherever you are coming from, wants to reject this world, we reject your ministry. You can preach like Spurgeon, who cares? It is when the word of God is settled in your heart, and you accept the word of God, and you live by the word of God, that we can walk together, whether you're a child or you're an adult. That's the word of the Lord. Take it, please. And you national overseers in your country, the Palai Bible Church is not family property. And it's not your property. If you know that your child is not born again, you know that your child is still telling lies, and your child is stealing money, and then in the national church of deeper life there, you put your girl to be singing special, and you put your boy to be playing organ, ah, you sell the church into the hands of your sinful children, you want to hand over the church to the hands of sinners, whether they are young or old, except somebody be born again and sanctified, washed in the blood of the Lamb, has approval of heaven upon his life, of heaven upon her life. How can you bring your child to come and be ministering, reading the Bible he doesn't believe? And if you are there, your wife, you know your wife, you know the word leanness, you know she rejects the word of God, you know how she tears the word of God in pieces at home, you know how she says, I don't accept that, I don't accept this, and then you bring your wife to be leading the women in our church, it's not your property. If your wife has rejected the word, if your children have rejected the word, 
The Lord has rejected your wife and your children. And if you like Eli, you are not able to bring your children under control. The Lord has even rejected you too. The only basis that you can stand on the pulpit and declare thus says the Lord is that you accept the word of God and your whole family me and my house, we are going to serve the Lord. That's the only privilege you have to even stay here at the Congress and say that you are one of our ministers. There are times we correct our young people here at the headquarters church. Then the adults, their parents, they don't like the correction of their children. They want us to leave their children on the platform and be ministering, 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 even if we see that things are wrong in the lives of their children. And when you parents do that, you are going to permanently take that ministry away from the children. Because when God raises a pastor that rebukes your children according to the word of the Lord and takes an opportunity from them that they do not merit because they are not living according to the word of God, if you parents, because of that, do anything or say anything, or act in any way to rebel against the word of God, that doesn't make us to restore your children. It just makes us to understand that the disobedience or the sin or the backsliding as itching deep is not only on the children, it's on those adults too. And it doesn't cost God anything to remove Eli and remove Phinehas and remove Ophni and remove the whole family. If we will not bow and come back under the authority of the word of God. The reason deeper life exists at all is because of the Bible. That's why we call it deeper life Bible church. What's the attitude we ought to have? It's, it's sometimes it surprises me when we all come together. And then I see some people who are supposed to be ministers. Whether they are women like the women there. Or they are men like the men here. And what they know we have said, this is church. Let us honor God. Let us bow before the authority of the word of God. And then we come in to show us they are not, that they are not part of the humble, accepting people of God. As we come in, they deliberately begin to do things that we have corrected. It only disqualifies you from being a minister of the word of God. Even if we don't know your name and we have not removed you physically, God has removed you. A Christian doesn't show boldness by rejecting the word. You show boldness by resisting the devil. You show boldness by resisting temptation. You show boldness by rejecting the suggestions of the devil. You don't show boldness by being able to aggressively, openly, in the midst of the people of God, reject the Bible. That's not boldness. That's backsliding. What's the Lord expecting from you and from me? That you will receive the word of the Lord. I read it to you already. That all scripture is given by inspiration. And it is profitable for doctrine. That's where some people want us to stop. That's alright, that's alright. Teach us doctrine. Follow on. It is profitable for reproof and correction. As you come in here this week, you'll find the word of God. Doctrine will come to you. Instruction will come to you. Then correction and reproof will come to you as well. What's the right attitude we're to have? Point number three, the reception of the word of the Lord. The reception of the word of the Lord. You receive the greatest benefit from such a gathering, a congress like this, where you receive the word of God to your heart. When you hear the word of God and you do not allow your mind to say, those are the opinions of the preacher, you know that it is the word of the Lord in truth. And after, after every session of preaching or teaching, whether in the plenary session or in the section that you have for pastors or language pastors and others, or in any seminars, after every session of preaching or teaching, you go to the Lord in prayer, taking those words to the Lord. In First Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 13, First Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 13, for this cause also thank we God 
without ceasing. Because when ye received the watch of God, which ye had of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God, which effectually walketh also in you that believe. That's the attitude we are to have when you hear the word of God here. You receive, you accept the word as the word of God indeed, not the words of men. And your attitude to the word of God will be an encouragement to people around you and to those who see you, the way you accept the word, the way you receive the word, the way you believe the word, the way you subject yourself to the word, and the way you pray after hearing the word, it will be an encouragement to all the others around you. If they were having the tendency of being careless, they'll be serious when they see your good attitude. In Acts chapter 17 verse 11. Acts 17 11. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. And that's why the Lord has brought us together this week. For you to be like the Berean Christians and like the Thessalonian Christians. Receive the word with all readiness of mind. When it comes sharp like a two-edged sword, receive. When it comes like a crushing hammer, receive it. When it comes with a burning heat of fire, receive it. And when it comes like water washing you, encouraging you, comforting you, receive it. When it comes like oil that suits the source that the sword of the word has created, you receive it. When it comes like honey and it is sweet to your taste, you receive it. When it comes bitter like gall and it appears it bitter in your taste because Jeremiah said, I took that word. Ezekiel said, I took that word. And both of them said, when it entered our mouth, it was sweet. When it got inside, it was bitter. When it comes in and it's bitter with the correction and with the instruction and with the rebuke and with the reproof, you receive the totality of the word of God. And you take it to the Lord in prayer. And our meeting here, this should be a congregation of adult, matured ministers who are asking the Lord. They want the Lord to take them to higher ground. This is not a congregation of babies. Now, during the prayer, you then be clapping your hand as if you want to stop the person that is praying. As if you are in a hurry. As if they forced you to come in here. We want to be serious here. We came to receive from the Lord. We're ministers. And it is as God develops you and strengthens you and lifts you up, He'll send you back to where you came from to go and strengthen your brethren. The future of this church depends on how you receive the word during this Congress. If you do not receive, there's no future for this church. If you're in a hurry and you don't want to hear everything the Lord has for you, there's no future for the church. If we cannot deny our stomach what it wants and concentrate on the Lord and pray until the word of God has effect in us, there will be no future for the church. And those who hinder us, those who disturb us, those who do not want us to pray, those who do not want the word of God to have, it's authority and effect in our lives. They don't love our church. They are just here. They don't want us to have revival. They don't want us to become better. They don't want the church to grow. Those who are here and they are not encouraging us to take in the totality of the word and to pray until God does something in every minister. They are here not because they love the church but because they hate the church. And they want the church to crumble, to fall and to be like all those other churches outside. Those are messengers of Satan who are here. If you love the church and you love God and you love the Bible, and you love the perishing world out there, you're going to come in here and sink in the word of God. And even if the word of God is cutting you or crushing you, doing whatever, you say, Lord, do it. Make me nothing until you become everything in my life. Those are the people that love this church. Who are the people there that came into this church? And so the glory 
of the first temple. Who are the people there? Among you adults. Those of you that came in the 70s. And you saw church. And you saw ministry. And you saw deeper life. How many of you are there that knew the glory of God upon this church? And even the people outside, in the various places of work, they'll be writing to us. They want our members to work for them. And if anybody wants to marry the daughter of anyone, the parents will say, if you have dowry, pay. If you don't have dowry, go. Because I know you are deeper life. How many of you there know the glory of the first temple? Look around. How many of you here, when deeper life member is coming on the way and is walking, and a witch or a wizard is coming and sees that shining star, that mark of the Lord upon the deeper life person, that witch will run away. How many of you there, when they kidnapped your child, and they took that child to the place they wanted to scrape the head. And the blade fell down. And their cup fell down and broke. And they asked the boy, they asked the girl, from where are you? And the boy said, our family is of deeper life. And all those people scattered. And they ran away. And they brought the child to the road. And the child did not know where he was going. And an angel came from heaven and put that child in the vehicle and rode with that child and got near the house and said, Boy, do you know your house? And the boy says, That's our house. And the angel vanished. How many of you know that? How many of you here knew the herbalists that wanted to hurt a deeper life member? And instead of being able to hurt the deeper life member, is the herbalist that died. And everybody started broadcasting in the village, deeper life, deeper life, don't touch them. Now, they kidnap your children now, we don't see them. Many, many things are happening now. Some of you women get pregnant one year, two years, you have not delivered. Some of you say that they are running after you in the dream and you mention the name of Jesus and the name of Jesus is not powerful and mighty in your mouth. How many of you there know the glory of this temple in the days gone by? That's why we are here. If you want that glory to come back, rise up and pray. Let the glory come back. Let the glory come back. Let the glory come back. Let the power come back. Let the seriousness come back. Let the holiness come back. Let the submission come back. Let the yieldedness come back. The glory, the glory, the glory of the former house. We didn't come here to play. Do you love the Lord? Do you love this church? Or you want it to crumble? It doesn't concern you. It doesn't concern you. It doesn't concern you. Even if the devil comes and takes over this church, it doesn't concern you. The word of the Lord. The word of the Lord. The word of the Lord. In the mouth of a deeper life preacher. In the olden days, they said we were the only one that knew to preach the Bible from cover to cover. In the olden days, they said they accused us that we felt we were better than any other Christian in the country. Where is that glory? Where is that glory? Where is that glory that will come here during this Congress and receive the word of God as the word of God and not the word of man? If you love the church, you love everything we're emphasizing from the pulpit here. If you don't love the church, you are going to rebel more and more. You are going to uh, refuse and you are going to be stubborn more and more. If you don't love the church, 
It doesn't matter to you whether we get back the old glory, the former glory or not. All you want is to finish in time and to serve your tummy and to serve your belly and to eat your food. That's all you want. That's all you want. The glory of the Lord coming upon the church of the Lord is not your concern. Are you one of us? Are you one of us? Are you concerned as we are concerned? Are you sorrowful as we are sorrowful? Are you sad as we are sad? Are you one of us? Do you want the glory of God upon our church? Do you want the power of God upon our church again? Do you, do, you, do you want that protection of God upon our church again? Are you one of us? Are you one of us? Are you one of us? Or somebody else sent you there to make our church to fall? Somebody sent you. Somebody sent you. Somebody sent you and taught you what to do to hinder the preaching of the word of God and the preaching and the power of the Lord in our midst. Who sent you? Why don't you turn around and say, I will love God. I will love the Bible. I will love the church of the living God. You want our church to lose all its power? You want our church to drop the restitution and the righteousness? You want our church to love the world? You want our church to become carnal? You want our church to totally backslide? You want our church to reject the word of God and not to stand upon the word of God anymore? You want our church to totally be crushed and crumble? You want our church only to be known for singing, only for singing and concert, only singing and concert, no more power, no more word of God, no more holiness, only singing, singing deep alive. What kind of church do you want this church to be? What kind of church do you want this church to be? What kind of church do you want this church to be? Are you our friend? Do you love us? Do you wish good for us? Do you love our church? Do you love our church? Or are you a messenger of somebody outside who sent you inside that you will destroy us so we will become like them? You woman there, do you love our church? You woman there, do you love our church? Why are you here with us? If you are not going to build up with us, if you are not going to accept the word of God, woman, why are you here? Whose messenger are you? Man, who are you? Are you part of us? Are we in agreement? Are we on one heart? Are we going to lift up this church and build this church that this church will be suddenly based, founded on the word of God? We are crying, you are laughing. We are sorrowful, you are happy. Are you part of us then? Ah, let's go back to the early days. Let's go back to the early days. And pray that God will walk in you and God will do something in you and then something will totally change and will come back under the authority of the word of God and be totally be submissive to the word of God. Your attitude to the word of God during this congress will determine what God will do for you, do for our church, what will bring revival. If you love the word of God more than ordinary food, it will show. If you love the word of God more than sleep, it will show. If you love the word of God more than your own preconceived ideas, it will show. Are you receiving the word or are you rejecting the word? If you have rejected the word, the Lord has also rejected you as a ministering woman, as a ministering man. 